Thank you, Dr. O'Donnell and Dr. Axmit. I'm thrilled to be here um, to talk to you a little bit about NTM lung infections, non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections. Um, I'm from Tyler, Texas. I work there. I was actually born around the area. If you don't know where it is, it's in northeast Texas. It's about two hours um, east of Dallas. And Tyler happens to be the rose capital of the world. That's a little bit of trivia. Um, Sometimes I've seen a few patients that stop by to see the roses and they say, we thought we'd just come by for another opinion, but we really just came to see the roses there in Tyler. <laughs> um, my father was a rose specialist. He studied rose diseases, um, and that's why I grew up in the region. Never thought I would move back to study mycobacterial disease. But about 30 or 40 years ago, they started to study these cousins of tuberculosis, these non-contagious mycobacteria in that a laboratory and the two mentors that I moved back to the region to study under are Dr. Richard Wallace and Dr. David Griffith and it, they've just been great to learn from. So I'm going to try to touch on Mycobacterium avium complex which Dr. O'Donnell has already mentioned and then Mycobacterium obsessus lung infection because these are complicated diseases and the question is what do you do when your doctor says we found MAC in your lungs or we found M. obsessus in your lungs and the first thing that's very encouraging about both of these diseases is that you don't have to panic. You really have some time to think about should you be treated, what you should be treated with, and by whom you should be treated. And so I think that this is a very interesting topic for us to discuss today. Unfortunately, I, you're not going to leave here with a recipe for how you as an individual should be treated. And the reason for that is it's different for every person. And you must take into account what other medications are people on, their lifestyle, whether or not they really have true disease, and whether or not they would benefit from the antibiotics that are used to treat these types of lung infections. So I wanted to just start with a few common myths that I hear. People are referred to our clinic with all kinds of stories that they've been told about MAC or M. obsessus. And one of the common things that I hear is that Treatment is worse than having the disease itself. I'm told that over and over. My doctor said that getting treated is worse than having the disease itself. I've also been told there's no treatment options. This is not a curable disease. This is not a disease that there's treatment that works. I'm only going to get it again if I get treated and that there's no treatment options besides antibiotics. So I wanted to go through some of these before we get started and I'll just talk about MAC for a minute. MAC is the most common mycobacteria that we see here in North America. Um, there are treatment options for MAC. Many cases are successfully treated. And I tell my patients the same reason that you got this infection to begin with is the same reason you may get the infection again. So we may successfully treat you, but this is a problem that you have to consider for the rest of your life should you have symptoms that come back. Treatment often helps the symptoms of MAC, and in fact, that's the number one reason why we should consider antibiotics in patients that have the symptoms and the associated changes on their CAT scans or on their x-rays. Many patients do undergo successful treatment, as I've mentioned. Sometimes we quote numbers like, if you don't have very severe changes on your CAT scans, maybe just some nodules with cough and you um, have multiple positive sputums for MAC and someone says you are diagnosed with MAC lung disease, after they take antibiotic treatment, as many as 85% actually can rid themselves of this infection. But again, many times they deal with it again in their lifetime because the way that you're made, I, I can't change and personally wouldn't want to. There are other treatment options besides antibiotics. And Dr. Daniels and Dr. McShane went through some of these airway clearance, worrying about nutrition, exercise, um, power positive thinking, all kinds of things actually do improve people's outcomes with or without antibiotics. So the number one reason, in my opinion as a patient, you should consider treatment for MAC if you have it is to feel better. These antibiotics are tough to take and I know that and you know that, but Many patients, after some months of therapy, say, I finally feel better. And how they describe that is less cough and less fatigue is kind of the number one and number two things that I see after people undergo treatment. There are other reasons to consider being treated. Um, and sometimes I'll see patients 
with large cavities in their lungs, or they have a lot of changes on CAT scans and things, and they say, well, I don't feel great, but I don't feel too bad. Oh, I don't know what to do. And the doctor says, well, you know, I really think you need to start antibiotics. And this is when it becomes very important that you trust the opinion of the physician that's talking to you or that's treating you. Because you may have a strong gut opinion about this, a doctor may have a strong gut opinion about this, and somehow you have to reconcile the two so that the two parties agree that this is the right way to proceed and be treated. And that's where trust and perhaps obtaining an opinion from a subspecialist is, becomes very important. So the treatment for MAC, I'm going to touch on this, it's often prescribed by an infectious disease or a lung doctor. Um, questions as a patient that you should ask the doctor is about his or her comfort level with treating these types of diseases. There are guidelines in place that are to be followed, but if the physician themselves are not comfortable treating the infection, they can usually get you to a place or to another opinion of someone that has experience treating these. And you have to have good communication with your physician in order to undergo successful treatment. I say this because if you are a patient in a doctor's office and they tell you, here, take these drugs, and it's a five-minute conversation, then you should be alerted to the fact that I, I may need some more information before I start to take these medications. And I'll go over those in a minute. Support groups, websites, and then being referred to a referral center. There's many now in the country, I'm happy to say, of people that can give you a good expert opinion on NTM lung disease is often necessary. So for MAC, mycobacterium avium complex, Dr. O'Donnell had mentioned and others that there are different types of bacteria within this complex, but the treatment as it exists currently is all the same. It's normally a combination of three drugs, and it's taken until you, can no, you no longer find MAC in the sputum samples, and then for one year after, that's the current guidelines. So in other words, typically people are on antibiotics somewhere between 16 and 24 months. And at first that sounds very daunting and, and often upsetting, and I can appreciate that I would feel the same way if I was in that position, but that's what it takes for this slowly growing bacteria to, to be treated. It's, it's difficult to eradicate or to remove from the sputum. So the drugs that we use, I just wanted to mention them. If, you've, if you have this infection in the room or you have a family member with it or if you ever heard of it, then you probably know these three. Some people call them the, the big three, the terrible three. Um, I call them life-saving for a lot of people. I, I actually am very, a big fan of these drugs. Um, but it's usually azithromycin or clithromycin, ethambutol, and rifampin or rifibutin. And these are chosen at the discretion of your physician in combination with other drugs that you're on, uh, other health problems that you may or may not have. But the things that we worry about the most with any antibiotics is nausea as a side effect. We also, with ethambutol, think about changes in your vision. That's why uh, vision is important to be monitored when you're on that drug. We also look for things like neuropathy or tingling in the, in the hands or in the feet. Rash can be common with these, changes in your blood counts. So all these things are monitored. And then with rifampin, um, it, it is a way that it's metabolized in your body, but it will turn your secretions, like your urine, your tears, your sweat, an orange color, which can be quite upsetting if no one's told you that that's a side effect that's normal with that drug. And then you can have flu-like symptoms or rash with that drug. And it's just important to sit down with your doctor and have a conversation about these so you know what to watch for. Um, the reality is many patients take them and they do okay. The decision for whether those drugs are taken three times a week or every day is also up to your physician. We think about things like like how um, severe your disease is on a CAT scan or on an X-ray in combination with how many times you've been treated and some other factors. So that's also just a com conversation to be had with the physician. We monitor blood work, eye exams, hearing exams, and then you must submit sputum samples so that we understand when this infection has been cleared from your sputum. And if you say, I can't produce sputum, there's other ways that we can obtain a sample, such as going down into the lungs and doing some washes and things. It's called a bronchoscopy, but usually, not always, but most of the time we can just monitor you by checking these sputum samples often. 
The caveat to this is you don't want to be put on these medications and then no samples ever be taken because we don't understand how long to treat you or if we're doing a good job with the treatment. So you have to monitor your sputum samples. And the other pearl that I wanted to mention is wouldn't it be great if we could take one antibiotic instead of three? And we agree with you, it would be great. But just as a tip for you as the patient, it is important that you don't take just one antibiotic for MAC, especially the azithromycin or the clarithromycin by itself, because the bacteria could become resistant. And I don't say that to scare you, because the majority of the time this does not happen, but if you find yourself on azithromycin by itself and you have MAC lung disease, you need to, you need to get another opinion because that, that's a, a dangerous sign that it could become resistant. So for MAC, or do we ever use inhaled antibiotics? Um, and I know if I ask for a show of hands in this room, if anyone's been on antibiotics, inhaled antibiotics, I'd get a lot of hand raising. We do use inhaled antibiotics for MAC, and in fact, there's been some recent trials that have shown that um, inhaled amikacin and, um, does um, have activity against MAC. We're very excited about the future for how to use these antibiotics. Um, it does not mean that every person needs to start on an inhaled antibiotic, but we're excited to understand more in the future about how to use these for treatment for MAC, and that that's... Um, an ongoing discussion that I think we'll know more about. Um, some people have more severe cases of MAC with cavities in their lungs, and when that happens, sometimes you need intravenous antibiotics, meaning a long-term line or some type of an access to give the medication in the bloodstream. And that medication um, usually is a drug called amikacin. The problem with amikacin that's most feared by patients is that it can affect your hearing and your kidneys. And so we just have to watch those things very closely to see if those changes are happening. And that's why you get hearing tests frequently and, um, and lab work so that we can understand, blood work rather, so that we can understand if your hearing is being affected. But this is a very potent antibiotic, amikacin is, for the treatment of MAC lung disease. And so, um, again, in combination with your physician, understanding why this drug may or may not be of benefit to you is very important. So when should you consider another opinion when you have MAC lung disease? Um, well, I think you should get another opinion uh, for any disease if you don't trust the current opinion that, that you've received. If you feel like you um, are teaching your doctor more about the condition you have than they're teaching you, then perhaps another opinion may ease your mind or become beneficial. Um, and then sometimes medication access and availability comes into play. And if, if that's the case, then going to a center that specializes in this is often helpful because we deal with this every day and we know how to get other drugs that are off the market um, or that are, quite frankly, difficult to order in the clinic. You should seek another opinion if you've been told there's nothing that can be done. Um, if you feel like you're not ready, or if you feel like you're at a point in your life that you wish you, you want to keep going, you feel like there's more options, and someone says, I, I can't help you any longer, then it is reasonable to obtain another opinion. And if there's a lack of laboratory availability, sometimes seeking another opinion helps, or at least having your sputum sent to a lab that does more fancy work um, is, is helpful um, because it can guide what kind of therapy that you receive. There are many doctors that do a great job of this without being sent to a referral center, and I see the results of that every day. I see people that are well treated for MAC lung disease in the community, and quite frankly, we do a lot of teaching so that doctors can feel empowered to treat this well, but if you feel like you're not getting the information that you need, there is help out there. So I want to move on to a bit more of a difficult disease process, Mycobacterium abscessus. A lot of people think that the word abscessus means that all of a sudden you have pustules or that your lungs fill up with literal abscesses. Um, Mycobacterium abscessus, also if you Google it, you may read that it's a rapidly growing mycobacteria. This is not a flesh-eating bacteria. This is not uh, a bacteria that if you don't do something about in 24 hours that, that people succumb to infection. 
It's very different, and it's one of the reasons it's a real pleasure to, to treat this disease is because you have some time to think. You have some time to consider the options. You have some time to discuss with patients and families what's really best for the patient. And there are many cases of mycobacterium obsessus that we never have to treat. I don't know if you were in, if any of you were in the, the conference this morning, but we talked about this as a group of clinicians that do this every day of our lives. We often say you don't need, we feel like you don't need treated for this mycobacterium obsessus. It does not cause horrible lung disease in every patient. But there are groups of patients that benefit from treatment. And someone like myself cares very much that I have a good lab, that I understand which drugs to use. Usually treatment involves a combination up front of intravenous antibiotics. And we usually combine that with some oral antibiotics. This also depends on what kind of bacteria you grow. It depends on, again, what other health problems you have, what other antibiotics you have, what drug allergies you have. But we usually use at least two to three antibiotics up front to treat this. And along with that comes some discussion about how to do it. Intravenous antibiotics can be given at home in the majority of our patients. Um, if you were here this morning, you've heard in other countries, some people are hospitalized for this up front. I would say the majority of us that treat this um, in the outpatient world in North America do this for patients at home. Um, the, the pretty girl here in the picture has a, what's called a pick line in. That is a line that is put into the arm, uh, goes into the vein, and that can stay in longer term so that patients can self-administer these antibiotics at home. And I have, I'm sorry that it's difficult to see, but the other picture is a picture of a port, which um, is, is something that goes under the skin and the chest that you can put a needle in at home and also give yourself intravenous antibiotics. Uh, mycobacterium obsessus, um, the blood work is a bit more frequent than what we do for MAC. Um, we have to monitor levels of these drugs sometimes, and we have to monitor the kidney and liver function more frequently. We still often have to check eye exams depending on um, what other drugs are being used. If someone is taking drugs that are, if, if you grow MAC and you grow obsessus and you're on multiple drugs, you still may be asked to get an eye exam. Um, hearing exams are very um, frequent, and then sputum samples are still obtained because, again, we want to know how we're doing with clearing this infection from, from your sputum. And, um, this is a deci these decisions to treat these are really a, a group effort. It's a combination of patient buy-in and patient symptoms in combination with their sputum results in combination with their CAT scans and their chest x-rays. And this is a group effort and a decision that we can do a lot for these types of infections together, but people have to be ready and be engaged in the process. My colleagues have already gone over a lot of websites that will help, and if you just even Google some of these, these are just some of the quick ones that popped up when I did a quick Google search, but. There are multiple um, websites that are available to help you understand NTM lung disease. Um, but I leave you with this. We are successful in treating quite a few of these diseases. I can't change who you are, but I don't want to do that. What we want is to establish relationships to keep you as healthy as possible for as long as possible. And I believe that can be done in the majority of people that we treat. And just to say that um, it's not just a disease of women, but men do get this disease too. And, uh, <laughs> and, and we can all do it together. So I want to thank you for your time and attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. a sputum or a CAT scan every six months or a year. Both my infectious disease doctor and my pulmonary doctor, who hadn't talked to each other, I mean, they know each other, but about it, both said, don't even think about it for a while. You're fine, you feel fine, you're 
don't do it because you're fine. So I don't know what to do. It's been maybe four years or more. Yeah, so the question is, how often should you monitor yourself with sputums and CAT scans and other things after you've been treated? Um, so let me, let me tell you, I'll tell you what I do in my own practice. There's not a great guidelines of how often to check certain things, but this is, this is what I usually do. After I treat someone, I still monitor their sputum. Now, that does not necessarily need to be done every month or every other month, but I think the majority of us would say you need some type of surveillance or to, to watch. If you have symptoms and you are coughing more, I always tell patients, please just send me a sample. And we have a system where you just mail us the sample in, in my own practice, so it's pretty easy to put one in the mail. In regards to CAT scans, I just want to point out that, um, you know, uh, I see a lot of patients that have been told you have nodules on your lungs or spots on your lungs, and then we realize that it's these mycobacteria or other infections. And um, we're not looking with these CAT scans in the majority of these types of patients for cancer. So you don't need a CAT scan every three months looking for cancer unless you have certain risk factors. And we do understand that there's quite a bit of radiation with these CAT scans. So I myself am trying to pull back and not order CAT scans as often, but um, you, you need to be followed with symptoms, with some sputum surveillance from time to time. If you have no symptoms, and you're doing well, then, then checking in with your doctor may be enough in, in your particular case. But I, again, this is a lifelong disease process. Bronchiectasis is a lifelong disease process. Um, it does not go away, and so the more you're monitored, the better. I'm just curious, um, are there any more studies being done right now looking for the genetic component for the predisposition to uh, getting NTM and the reason I bring this up is my sister was just diagnosed. And I was diagnosed in 95, and she's just diagnosed now, and I, it certainly does lean itself towards genetic. Uh, but just curious, are there any more studies being done? Yes, and I, I know that the NIH and Dr. Ken Olivier and, and others are looking into genetic reasons. And, you know, I wish that there was just one gene that we could isolate or that we could talk about that say this is, this is how all of these things are inherited. But I don't think we have the answer to that. But, yes, studies are ongoing. And it's, it's vital information that I think we need to continue to work on. Uh, you mentioned amikacin as one of the medications for both treatment of MAC as well as abscesses. Um, I've heard that there is a liposomal version of amikacin that is, I guess, in hopefully the final stages of testing. So I was wondering if today during the conference if the physicians were able to talk about if this is a promising drug as far as, I guess, um, not having the same type of side effects as IV amikacin or oral amikacin. So the, th thank you for bringing that up. The, um, liposomal amikacin that you mentioned is the inhaled antibiotic that I briefly touched on that was being studied. Uh, what this basically means is this antibiotic is attached to a, almost like a fat molecule to, to enter into the lungs and hopefully penetrate better where this MAC infection is. Um, it did show, and this was presented in May and through some other studies that have come out, it has shown great promise in the use of MAC. And the use of this version of amikacin that's inhaled it has uh, less side effects in terms of hearing loss and, and um, kidney injury or kidney toxicity. So I think this is of great promise for the future that we're going to hear more and more about shortly. It is not available on the market right now to give to any patient that would like to use it, but we may see that that changes in the future. Thank you.